to trust in Jesus. I've learned how to trust in God through it all. I've made my mind up. I've drawn a line in the sand. I made my declaration. He's God of the mountain. He's God of the valley. He's God of the night. He's God when I'm weak. He's God when I'm strong.
Thank you so much for tuning in to NHBC's live stream. Are you wondering how you can sow into the kingdom of God? I'm glad you asked. There are a couple of options. Option one. Go to our website by typing www.newhomebc.org. Scroll down and select the online giving option. Then select give online to sow your seed. Option two, go to www.newhomebc.org. Once again, scroll down to select the tab that says online giving, and then select the Givelify option to sow your seed. You can also download the Givelify app onto your smart device. Once you've opened the Givelify application, you can type New Home Baptist Church, located in Landover, Maryland, in the search engine to sow your seed. Other ways to give. You can contact our front office to schedule other options to sow. On behalf of Pastor and First Lady Hicks and the NHBC family, Thank you so much for your liberal giving and cheerfully sowing into the kingdom of God. Happy Sunday, everybody. By God's grace, we've made it through yet another week. The topic I wanted to quickly touch on today is the power of words. The Bible teaches us in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life is in the power of the tongue. Even as kids, we've always been taught, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. But let's put Proverbs 18, 21 into a practical sense. I was recently watching an interview of a Navy SEAL. If you don't know what a Navy SEAL is, Google it. But the gist, elite physical capabilities, elite mental fortitude. As these guys were going through training, one guy noticed one of his close buddies was really struggling. But as long as his buddy kept pushing, his buddy was okay. Then the day came. His buddy broke down and came to him and said, look man, I don't think I'm good enough. When he spoke those words, it crushed him. When he gave life to, I don't think I'm good enough, it crushed him. He eventually quit. So my message to you today is, whatever we give life to verbally is gonna play a significant role in how our lives play out. Whether it's I am good enough or I'm not good enough, it's up to you. But I'll leave you with this quote. He who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. I'll say that again. He who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. Have a blessed week. See you soon.
but for your grace. God, God he loves me. your mouth and tell him thank you thank you God for your grace for your favor for your peace for your healing God knows we need it in this time and God we're putting our trust we're putting our hope in you father for you care for us and we thank you come on you want to wave your hand and tell him thank you thank you Jesus thank you thank you thank you thank you we realize that you didn't have to give it to us but you loved us so much that you freely give. Oh, and while you're giving it, God, we freely receive. We receive all that you have for us, Jesus. And we realize that if it had not been for you, we would be Sinking deep in sin, God, you still love us. Whoa, we turned our backs on you. God, you forgave us time after time, time after time. You made way out of no way, God. We just want to say pray. Thank you for your keeping power. Thank you for your grace that never ends. It's a miracle. God morning, everybody. God morning. God speed be upon each and every one of you. Grace and peace from God our Father, who has blessed us once again. How about that? Grace, grace, grace. As much as we know it, as much as we experience it, we still don't comprehend the 
measure of God's grace and his love towards us. What an amazing story. What an amazing act that God has shown towards us. What say you about that Capria McClellan? What a gift she is to the body of Christ. What a gift she is to the kingdom of God. She is extended family to the Hicks family. And we certainly appreciate her extending her love and gift and talent in this worship experience with us. We thank and praise God for you, Capria. To your husband, Elder Sam McLaren. Uh, to your bishop, uh, Bishop Robinson and First Lady Robinson there at the Master's Child. Thank y'all so much for sharing with us today. New Home Nation, how y'all doing? I pray God's riches and blessings be with you. That God's love is overtaking you and blessing you in this very, very hour. I want to honor and give respect to every tier of leadership, to all of the members, and um, pray that you're staying safe and doing what is right uh, in this season. Let me thank again Team Hicks uh, for what they do to help us come to you and stay connected in this way. Let me thank those of you who responded in a tangible way last week. Uh, for being thoughtful and kind and generous towards them. It means a great deal. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Um, this week is Memorial Week. In many years, many times, we have monetized it and used it as social gatherings and events, but the real thrust of that meaning is that men and women who draped the uniform stood in harm's way and paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we can walk in safety and freedom. That's what this is really about. Those men and women who served our country from day one all the way to a career. I want to say I salute you I honor you. For those who have paid the ultimate price, for those who have served our country and uh, even retired, and those who are active in duty as I speak, we truly honor you and thank God for you. You are the real heroes and sheroes, in my opinion. You matter so much, and I honor each and every one of you. We lost... Uh, another soldier from another army uh, and uh, the conclusion of that took place on yesterday in the person and personality of Reverend Dr. Ronald Keith Minor. Um, miss him already and I pray God's peace upon his family and all of those of you who knew him shared with him and been touched by him in some way. Um, he stood his and shoulders in his physical stature and then in many of his characteristics he stood head and shoulders as well. Um, we concluded that on yesterday. Now we commence with the idea now that he's not physically around. Not just only him, but those who have left us. Those family members who are now planning uh, services for their loved ones. We pray for you. This is extremely difficult and challenging. But as Capria sung to us, God's grace. God's grace. And in fact, you can get that single, single, digitally served, means being sailed in every place possibly. Please download it. Go get it. 
and uh, show your love and appreciation to Capria for her being a blessing to us in this hour. And I'm sure it will come up on the screen uh, as the service goes along uh, that you'll get that information and go after it. To those of you who are um, celebrating birthdays today, last week, this week, we celebrate with you and congratulate you on another birthday, anniversaries, landmarks, special moments, moments of memory. We, we tell you to be creative and celebrate graduations. Live life the best you can. It's a one-way trip. There's no round trip to this. It's a one-way trip. So live it qualitatively as much as we can quantitatively. From the Hicks family, we want to say we love you all, miss you all, miss being in the same space. I miss the call and response during the preaching moment. And, um, but here we are. We're still here and we're still staying connected. Uh, today, uh, I am poisoned with the idea of just to teach, just to sit with you and just teach and share from the Holy Writ some principles of the kingdom, some principles of the kingdom. Um, would you bow your heads with me? God, our Father, we're grateful and thankful even in this hour. We honor and adore you and reverence you for your excellence and your greatness. You are such a wonder and a splendor. Bless now these your people. Hold them in your hands and keep them by the power of your grace. And help us, Lord, to do our due diligence. Be with us now as we share. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. New Home, come this Wednesday, my wife and Reverend Jay and I will do part two on calm but yet cautious. We're going to talk and share in practical ways as we did last week. And um, pray that you would join us and be a part of that. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do what you know to do. You do, you do what is proven to be true. You do what is practical. And so we're going to stay safe. We're going to do what is right by every human life. We don't need at this season to actually have to be in the building to have connection with God and with one another. So we're going to remain vigilant and do our due diligence and pray and seek God's face be led by his spirit seek his counsel and do what is right we're not going to be pawns we're not going to be uh, used in any way for political reasons hidden motives agendas because black and brown people are more susceptible for multiple reasons as it relates to this, this virus, this pestilence. And so what we're going to do is be wise and not succumb to uh, the antics and the subliminal schemes of senator minds. So we're going to stay safe, do what is right, practice patience, have temperance, Trust God, keep ourselves healthy and safe. And we're going to do all those practical things so that when we do come back together, uh, we'll be in a good place. And I pray that you would extend that to your family, your friends, associates, to whom you have influence, and encourage them to do what is right for themselves and for one another. Go with me to Matthew's chapter 7. And we're going to look at verses 15 through 20. Um, Matthew chapter 7, 15 through 20. 
will be the focus and fixation of our reading and our discussion today. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. If you want to tag this, uh, any kind of topic or subject matter, uh, I'm going to talk from this. Call it what it is. Call it what it is. And I believe that is critically important in this day for us to name things, call it out as it is. To not make excuses for what is or what is not. The line of distinction with real clarity is blurred even on his way to being erased because we won't call it as it is. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthews is perhaps, in my opinion, the most profound and prophetic teachings in the entire Bible. Why? Because Christ himself is speaking. Why? Because Christ is conveying to us the thoughts of the Father of what the kingdom should look like on earth as it is in heaven. This is pre-Calvary, pre-resurrection, but information that will give us a narrative of how we should live. The Christian life in this world to not be succumbed by uh, the systems of this world that while we are in this world we're not of it and that our affections are set on things that are above Jesus clearly speaks to us some 18 uh, subject matters for us to follow We have no excuse. We can know the way to the Father, know the way of the kingdom if we would follow closely and practically Matthews 5, 6, and 7. It is in chapter 7 that uh, he give us the triplets of the twins. Uh, he gives us the two ways, the two trees, and the two foundations. And we know that in the two ways that he spoke of, the contrast and the comparison between the broad way and the narrow way speaks volumes to us. The broad way is popular because it is permissive. The narrow way is difficult because it's demanding. And you and I have to make that conscious decision of which path we're going to take. One way leads to life, another way leads to death. And the broad way, most people follow because the rules are lenient. It allows us to be us. It allows us to do what we want, when we want based on how we feel. It removes from us the principles of the kingdom. 
That's what the broad way does. The narrow way keeps us disciplined, which offers to us walks of sanctification, the purging, the demands that is set upon the believer's life should cost us something. And if our faith don't cost us anything, then it's a question of how genuine it is. If our faith don't challenge us and our lifestyles don't change, then it's a question of how authentic, genuine, and pure it really is. The two foundations in the latter part of this chapter deals primarily with the fact that everything looks the same. The houses look the same. They perhaps have the same square footage, perhaps built out of the same material. The difference is, is what it's standing on. And oftentimes, that's what makes the difference of the life of the believer. What are you resting your life on? And oftentimes, it is what's invisible that keeps you more than what is visible because we are just creatures of sight. And that's a segue into where I'm going because we are moved by our sight line. That if we're going to do our due diligence, we got to see beyond what is there. We got to pay attention to what we don't hear. We got to watch what's not happening. We got to be very wise if we're going to be holistic to not only see what is being said, but what's not being said. Because storms will come in our life. The winds will blow. The rains will descend. And the proof of where we really stand will be proven in the foundation. So the concentration should be more on our depth than our height. It should be more foundational than elevation. That's what's going to keep us in this hour. The text that I read in our hearing has to do with the fact of the two trees, the two types of trees. And in the backdrop of this lesson where Jesus was teaching early on was how do we handle judging without being judgmental? How do we really be discerning of the right and the wrong? How do we determine what is false to what is true? Because deception is real. Deceivers are real. False prophets are real. And there are at least two things that brings about real deception for people who get deceived. There are two things that normally happens. One, you're normally not informed enough to make a wise decision. Or two, you're so displeased with what's going on that you now have become accepting and susceptible to something new and different. If you're not informed, that means you're not doing your due diligence, you're not studying, you're not staying prayerful, you're not staying sensitive to sovereignty. Wherein now that anything and everything can come your way and give a false appearance. An appearance that appears to be true, but yet it's false underneath. Or you're so disgruntled, displeased at the current situation that you allow something new, fresh, and trendy uh, to overtake you. And we got to be cognizant of the two. I got to be sensitive to stay in a good place of seeking and searching and knowing with true convictions what my walk ought to be at the same time, at the same time, 
not getting to a place of being displeased or disgruntled because those are the two avenues where deception comes in. Jesus opens up by saying, beware. Now, when you talk about beware, that's a warning. But what makes the warning authentic is our watching. When God, through Christ, warns us of something, when the prophets come and speak to us and give us warning of something, it means to watch. It means to be alert. It means just don't take the warning without watching. It means that you've got to become a very observant person and intensify your 2020 vision. That not only are you seeing at the surface level, but you're also seeing underneath it. That you're not only hearing tone, but you're understanding text. It means that you and I have to become very discerning to overcome deception and deceit. And that's how false prophets come. And we're living in a season now where false things are occurring all over the land. But things are being told to us that has no godly content and no benefit for God's people in it. It's forms of deception hidden with godly talk. That's what makes evil so evil is that evil doesn't appear to be evil gives you the false notion that it's for your benefit when really it's for your demise. And so we need to pull back and take into account deception has been around since the Garden of Eden. We know that. When Adam and Eve got deceived and it trickled down from there throughout every generation. In fact, one of the boldest prophets in Isaiah, who I love, spoke loud and clear in the 30th chapter of Isaiah, and in the verse number 9 and 10, he says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceit. And that's where we are. That we don't want a word that's going to correct and cut and cleanse us. What we really want is something that's going to make us feel good. I really believe now that if we're going to get better, we got to do some cleansing, some sanctifying, some purging. And be aware of the false antics around us. That was spoken in the 7th century or the 8th century prophet Isaiah. Who declared unto us that the people were rebellious. They had become lying children. And they spoke loud and clear to the seers. We don't want you to see anything. Don't reveal anything to us. If you're going to prophesy, please keep it soft and smooth. And that's where the crowd is swelling today. Because where there's real challenge for responsibility and discipline and telling us to take that narrow path, people are avoiding that. Only the true saints who have the true calling on their life, who's in true fellowship with the Father, they are not capable of walking away from God. You're not capable because once you're in the Father's hand and once you have a real relationship with him and once he takes up residence in your, the hallways of your mind, in your heart, to the very citadel of your soul, you cannot escape God. You can't run from him. We waffle, we slow down, we sometimes don't perform but you can't escape him because he's that real in your life. 
But if it's just external or surface oriented, you can have good religion without a real relationship with God. Now listen how the falsity takes place in this text. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. The first thing they know to do is cover up the exterior because we're driven by our side, line, side sight line. They know that we don't dig deep enough below the surface. So we're always taken by what we see. How beautiful or how ugly things look on the outside determine our acceptance of it. And we throw away content and value simply because of what our eyes show us. So we warm up to that which looks warm, lovely, beautiful, attractive. We back away and disdain that which looks ugly or not so appealing. And that's a danger zone. So the deceiver knows in order to get our attention, they dress up like how we're supposed to be or how we are. They put on the same antics. They put on the same clothing. They act the same way. But underneath, they're raving wolves. This word raving has an interpretation of being swindler. Wolves are ferocious and merciless. So underneath this exterior, you're dealing with somebody that is a swindler who's going to do something for their gain, their benefit, take something from you, and they are ferocious and merciless. But you don't see it coming because they look like you. They talk like you. They even smell like you on the outside. They know the proper church talk proper church protocol. Normally they're gifted. They can sing. They can teach. They know how to communicate. That's how the deception begins. If it's obvious to us that it's dangerous, we know how to back away from it from the start. Deception is sweet and smooth. And therefore, Jesus gives us warning by telling us to watch because one of the blurred lines is we say don't judge me don't judge me just don't judge me now, now why, why is that is that a statement of so that I can stay in the broad way is that a statement so I can take the broad path is that a statement that you don't want to be confined to restrictions don't judge me we know ultimately none of us are qualified to cast a verdict meaning the beginning, the middle, and the end of what's going to take place in a person's life. We're not omniscient. We're not omnipotent. But we should be discerning and fruit inspectors to know right from wrong. It's clear to us that we know our colors. If something's supposed to be orange and someone is telling you it's pink, it's not a judgment when they tell you, hey, Look at this pink orange. And you say, oh, no, 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 no. Oranges don't come pink. They come orange. You know that. That's not a judgment. Christians don't act like the world. And if we're worldly in nature and make it a practice, it's not a judgment call to say, that's not a pictorial of the kingdom. But we say, don't judge me, and then we regress, back away, because we don't want to deal with the conflict. And then people throw at us, or oh, you're holier than thou, which makes you retreat. Listen, when we are even wrong, we still should speak what's right. Even when we are not perfect at what we're doing, we should point to what perfection looks like. There's no excuse for us to run away from what is right, even when... We have not arrived. Paul said this. I have not yet attained. But I pursue after. I'm telling you what's perfection while I am imperfect. I'm telling you what it looks like while I have not yet arrived. 
That's why the standards are lowered. Because we allow deception to come in. Listen to what Jesus says to them. He says, For ye know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns and figs of thistles? And we know that grapes don't grow on thorns. We know uh, that uh, in the text that figs don't grow on thistles and grapes on thorns. We know that. We know that. So if a grape is growing on a thorn, then we call that into question. Because we know they grow on vines. We know figs grow on trees. Thristles are pricky like little flowers that don't have the capacity to produce figs. And so we should know that and be discerning of that. And when we call it as it is and call it out, it does not allow the deception to be emboldened. This is why a few people in our setting can reap havoc where the majority of people know right and wrong and want to do what's right, that wrong is allowed. How do the minority of three or four people control the majority of a hundred? It's because the other 96 to 97 go silent go inactive, lack courage to do what is right, so wrong prevail. This is what we do. We're quiet in the open about it. And then in private, we'll say, well, you know, you know you're right. You know you're right. We lack the courage to do what is right publicly. So the deceit and the deception as a platform to be emboldened. We need to call it out. And call it what it is. He says you know them by the fruit. And this, in other words. Your words alone. Won't validate you. Your works also. Will give. Validation. To the words that you're speaking. Because in actuality. What Jesus is saying is. That a good tree. A good tree cannot produce evil fruit. A goodly, godly person who's good and godly to the core will not be evil. A person who has love in their heart and forgiveness in their heart cannot promote hate and evil and racism and classism. If it's in your heart to be loving and kind to people, you don't walk around practicing evil. And the contrast is just as, just as true. If you're evil in your heart, you cannot produce good works. You can pretend for a moment, but what's in you is really going to come out of you. And so Jesus metaphorically, figuratively uses this tree to show us that they represent the lives of people who are supposed to be manifesting in the kingdom on earth what's in heaven. That a good tree can only produce good fruit. So our observation should be through the warning is watching. Don't just be taken by words if you don't follow a person's works. Don't get caught up in the language if you don't pay attention to the lifestyle. That's why there's a lot of posting out here on social media and people say some things that sound so profound. But then watch their life afterwards. Watch their life afterwards. There's a lot of instructors and a lot of instructions that we get from people to do this, to do that, unfolding these insights and revelations to us. 
but they're not on duty. They're not present. They're not there with their lifestyle. This is not a judgment call. This is an inspection. Like when we take our cars to be inspected. When they inspect our brakes and they say you only have a certain percentage left on your pads. That's not a judgment call. That's an inspection. If you ignore the inspection, your brakes go out on you. You jeopardize your life and the lives of others. If your headlight is out, that's not a judgment call. That's an inspection. When you look at the gauges on your car and they speak to you, it's not a judgment call. That's an inspection. And the house of God, the people of God on the earth need to make the distinction between what's false and what's true. This is why sin is emboldening itself. And I'm quite familiar with Matthew 24, where the Bible says to us that iniquity will abound. False crises will rise. False prophets will come. It's no question that undisciplined behavior will become the order of the day. No question. But that doesn't give us, who are the kingdom, an excuse to go along so we can get along. No, 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 that's not our approach. We're children of the Most High. We're children of light, L-I-G-H-T. We're children of love, L-O-V-E. We produce good fruits even in bad times. Even when bad soil is around us. When bad weather falls upon us. When bad situations produce themselves around us. We are called and commanded to still produce good fruit. Our language must stay positive. Our works must stay positive. The way we discern what's false and what's real is examine the fruit. And the way you examine the fruit, you pay attention to the root. If it's not rooted right, it won't be fruited right. The lasting value of what comes up comes from the foundation, from the core of who we are. And Jesus says to the multitude, next to the last subject matter, he gives us warning to watch. Lesson 17, he tells us a warning and to watch. He closed with the 18th subject by saying, now be doers of the word. Warning, watch, then work it out. Hashtag that. Warning, watch, work it out. Warning, watch, work it out. Jesus says that in every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. That's clear. If the fruit is evil, than the person is. Clear. If the fruit is good, then the person is. That's clear. But give it time and space because the deception is that evil can disguise itself for a moment. Evil can temporarily appear as light, as ministers as instruments of good, but give it time. Give it, give it time, and you'll discover what is and what is not. You don't have to go around advertising, proving to people who you are. If you're good, good works, good fruit will follow you. And they will know it. They may not compliment it. They may not acknowledge it. They may not support it, but they will know because evil recognizes good. Unrighteousness is aware of righteousness. Strength and weakness understand each other. And they know their functionality. 
They know the very essence of what they produce. A good tree always bringeth forth good fruit. But a bad tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And Jesus says to us, here is the indicator. Here's how you monitor it. Watch the fruit. Don't pay attention always to the sound. Don't pay attention to the actions. Don't pay attention so much to the display and the presentation. See if there be any fruit on it. And determine if the fruit is good. Or is the fruit evil? Can I eat it and it help me? Or if I eat it and it makes me sick? If I eat it, is it medicine to me? If I eat it, is it poison to me? Do it benefit me or do it put me at a disadvantage? That's clear and glaring for us. And we need to call it as it is. Sin is sin, period. Righteousness is righteousness, period. And when we sin, we got grace to pick us up. We shouldn't cover up what's wrong Nor should we cover up what is right. Because to not speak truth when it's needed is a vote and an action for the untruth to continue. We should speak the truth in love with the intent of constructing, not destructing. We should say it from a place as if we're not judge and jury, but as concerned citizens of the kingdom, that this is what the Father wants us to do. This is how we ought to mirror our lives, and this is the image in which we ought to walk in. So we need to learn to really call it as it is. We're living in an evil, sinister time where the deception is real. Notice the deception is real. In this COVID-19, people will give you fake and false phone calls, promise you loans, do everything to take your credit, to steal your identity, to falsify information, because it always come on a letterhead or a covering that looks authentic. Ministries are popping up, because they know you're hurting, walking with a sense of real concern, some even fear. And your impulsivity will make you respond too quick. This is why you got to calm down, slow it down. Because when you don't know what to do, you do what you know to do. That's what you do. If that's no more than pushing the pause button, that's what you do. And you don't allow ungodly people who try to give a godly presentation to you to tell you what God is saying and doing when you know they're not living the Christian lifestyle. We got an administration. This is not a judgment call. This is an inspection and a sense of discernment that if their lifestyle was truly under uh, the subjectivity of God, Many things would not have been said and done and presented the way it already has been. This is scam and sinister. Wolves putting on sheep clothing to put you and yours in harm's way. Stay in the house. Stay sheltered. Be wise. Be nobody's exam. Because when you're gone, the only one's going to cry for you and miss you and ache for you is the people that love you. You can pray at home. We can talk through technology. We can stay connected through letters and text messages and emails. We'll get there. We'll get there. So Jesus says, know them. Know them. That's a sense of knowledge. Know them. Know the facts. Gather the data, the information. Follow 
the warning, the watching, and the working it out to make sure what is true and what is not true. And let us take the courage to call it as it is. Because that's a mistake we, the saints of the Most High, have been making. We lack the true courage and the love of God in the kingdom to call it as it is. A dancing leg and a praying knee don't grow on the same limb. You cannot party like the world and praise yourself in the kingdom. You can't. You got to make a decision. You got to make a decision. Anything that gives great pleasure to the flesh is an offense to the kingdom. Period. Anything that allows us to be docile and go to the place of enchantment in contrast to the due diligence that we ought to be doing towards the kingdom is a form of deception. Anytime someone want to dumb down and lower the standards in order to make you feel good, that's lowering the standards. I'm not talking about the frivolous external stuff about what a person wear and, and what their lifestyle currently is and they're looking for transformation. I'm not talking about holding such religious acts that you can't come to church uh, unless you dress a certain way, unless you, you got to sit a certain I'm not talking about that little frivolous stuff. I'm talking about real change. I don't care if you have on jeans. I don't care if you have on flip-flops. If your heart is right, you're in good standards. You can have on a hat and a tie and be one of these raving wolves. And that's what's so, so deceiving. We got so many people in the church that's prohibiting people from coming to church because they hide in sheep clothing, but all the while, they're nothing but raving wolves. They bite like wolves. They smell like wolves. They're ferocious like wolves. They're merciless like wolves. They fight you tooth and nail. And the reason why that happened is because we're uninformed. We don't understand scripture, so we follow a practice that we've seen passed down to us, but we don't put our head in the Bible and put our knees on the ground and seek the Lord for wisdom. Lord, what is the mind of God? What is your will exactly? Our human intelligence won't suffice. We need godly wisdom. We need spirit-led people. Because people who are misled are people who are misinformed or people who are displeased with the present situation. I close when I tell you this. When we get deceived, there has to be a little larceny in our own heart. When someone walks up to you and sell you an item on the street, or pull something out the trunk of their car and it has no guarantees. You think you're getting a deal at a reduced price. You might. But at the same note, you can't be upset and mad if you don't get what you thought you was getting. Because you only get deceived when you want to take shortcuts. Sometimes the shortest way home is taking the longest route there. And sometimes the longest route to get home is taking the shortcut. Because when you take shortcuts, you get cut. And when you take shortcuts and find out it don't work, you got to start it all over again. That's why you can't be so cheap in your decisions and in your actions. Because being cheap don't help you. Good things are expensive. Quality things are expensive. Cheap things are inexpensive. There's a reason for it. The quality of your life is expensive. So it's going to cost you something. If you want the cheap way, then you're going to live with artificial stuff at reduced prices. That's going to cost you more at the end. I say to you, New Home Nation, let's call it as it is. Let's call it what it is. 
in yourself first, and then in your surroundings. Call it what it is. If it's a good tree, it's going to produce good fruit. If it's an evil tree, it's going to produce evil fruit. Know the fruit that is around you. And the fruit that don't bear good fruit, the Bible gives a judgment call to it. It gives a judgment call in verse 19. That every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down, is cut off, and it is cast into the fire. The life of the tree is destroyed and burned up as the soul of those of us who don't do the purging. It's better to do the purging and allow some things to trim you back than to be completely cut off and cast into the fire. New home, I love you. I pray God's richest blessings upon you. We'll talk with you again on Wednesday about be calm but yet cautious. I'll be back in a couple of hours or so to greet those of you who love to greet me on Sunday after service. I love that exchange with you. It means a great deal. And lastly, I want to thank those of you who think well enough of me to text, to call, to send words of encouragement. I need it, and I appreciate it. God bless you, and God keep you as my prayer. Peace and blessings.